How did Putin come to power? We could provide you with a breakdown of the timeline, walk through Putin's progression from KGB agent in East Germany, through his vice mayorship in St. Petersburg, and on to the presidency, but this wouldn't tell us much, would it? Sure, it would explain how he maneuvered his way through politics, oligarchs, and military hardliners to be the golden child, but would that really help us understand how something like this happens? Would it help us prevent the rise of totalitarian leaders again? In order to really map out what happened, we are going to need some help. In her work, The Origins of Totalitarianism, Hannah Arendt lays out a clear progression from the transformation from a democratic nation-state into a totalitarian one. In this video, we will use her work as a general guide to help explain how Putin managed to trick an entire country. The first thing we need to understand is that modern Russia is an incredibly young democracy comparable to those of the early 20th century in Western Europe, such as France, Britain, and Germany. We can see the ingredients set out on the table to make tyranny soup in the 1920s in Germany, much like we see it in Russia of the 1990s. Much like the humiliation of Germany after World War I and the collapse of its empire and international prestige, Russia was absolutely humiliated with the collapse of the Soviet Union. Not only did Moscow lose huge swaths of territory, but the idea of Russian nationalist pride, something that drove the population since the days of Stalin, had largely vanished. What this amounts to is a collapse of meaning. The average Russian no longer felt that they could be proud to be part of a powerful player on the world stage. They felt suddenly unimportant as a people. There is a word for this. It is nihilism. Nihilism is when one dwells in a space of no meaning or purpose after that which drove and motivated them suddenly collapses. When you combine this with economic hardship, you get a recipe for absolute disaster. Enter both Adolf Hitler and Vladimir Putin. Even democracies that survived this period looked particularly bleak when they were about as old as the Russian democracy today. France was split between Marxist ideals and fascist ideals, and Britain struggled with communist riots on the regular. It really seemed to much of the world that democracies were weak and inept in the face of crises. For the average person struggling to find meaning in such turmoil, a leader who claims to be their champion, to be on a mission to reclaim their pride, seems like a great thing. These leaders will often gain large amounts of support quickly when the population is so desperate for something to believe in. Putin made himself this man. His propaganda teams worked diligently to present him as the embodiment of the proud, strong Russian that would guide them through this difficult period. The free-falling Russian economy of the 90s largely ended up in the hands of a small group of oligarchs, as all of the state-owned industry had to be sold off to private ownership. So much of the power in the hands of so few billionaires made it difficult for the new democracy to gain power and legitimacy, and corruption was rampant. This further damaged the confidence that average Russians had in this new democratic process. Putin came in with something different in mind. He forced the oligarchs to toe the line and support the Russian government by allowing them many of the privileges they desired, such as free travel and ownership of real estate in the West. What Putin essentially set up was something that looks more like a mob-run operation than a democracy, and in many ways was just a disguised version of the old Soviet system as he could exert direct control over these industries with his influence over the oligarchs. Putin was cautious at first, biding his time while he rebuilt the military, solidified his control at home with purges and crackdowns, and forging the diplomatic relations he desired. As time went on and he became more confident, he began to exercise his true desires, very similar to how Hitler began annexing territory that he deemed to be stolen once because of the disaster of the Treaty of Versailles. This new and heavy-handed approach came with a problem, however, the economy. The flurry of Western investment in business in Russia after the Soviet Union collapse was beginning to diversify the economy, making it more globally integrated. Putin's actions, such as that in Chechnya, Georgia, and Syria, would always hit the average Russians where it hurt. So, to justify this, like Hitler, he needed a scapegoat, an adversary of Russia herself. When just a few years before it seemed like Russia and the West could be new friends, now they found themselves as enemies again. 
Putin began speaking of the West as trying to confine and strangle Russia, appealing to younger Russians that are more easily excitable by nationalist sentiment. The irony here, of course, is that it was Putin that was isolating his country from the world and turning the West into an enemy. And he did this for one reason, his damaged pride from the fall of the Soviet Union, just like Hitler's damaged pride at the fall of the German Empire. Putin had established himself as the savior against this foreign threat. And with this, he began to impose strict state media, crack down on any progressive movements or figures, and complete the standard step taken by any authoritarian regime. So how did Putin come to power? He came to power because of injured pride and the loss of meaning amongst so many people who relied on national pride for a sense of purpose in their lives. The inability of the Russian democracy to fend off corruption made for easy prey for Putin, and many Russians, understandably, were happy to welcome someone that would re-establish Russia as a respectable power. The problem here is that once someone subscribes to a particular ideology or person and adopts them as their source of meaning, this person loses all sense of individual moral capacity. In other words, Putin's word now dictates what is good, what is evil, what is true, and what is false. This creates what Hannah Arendt would call the classless masses, a mass of intellectual zombies who have bought in so hard to an idea and a person that they will follow it to the end, because they have no other source of substantial meaning in their lives. We need not look any further than the war in Ukraine for a demonstration of this. Putin branded the Ukrainian government and much of the West as Nazis, an easy buzzword that brings up an old national enemy. And the falsity of this is so obvious, yet Russians who have already bought into Putin do not care. You see, it has nothing to do with what one believes as truth, but who one has chosen to follow. In a world where truth is difficult to find, they have simplified it by serving what they see as their protector and will never believe anything else. Long story short, people felt isolated, disconnected, and purposeless after the collapse of the Soviet Empire. Russian nationalism gave them something to feel good about, and Putin used this knowing full well that it was just a tool. Putin, like all dictators, is focused on his legacy and his power. He does not care about Russian lives or livelihood. He is a false flag, a false banner claiming to bring salvation and protection, but is a simple vessel trying to satisfy his man-child psychology and damaged pride. Now, let us keep in mind, America and the West are far from perfect, and Putin has raised some genuine concerns about NATO expansion. But it is precisely America's ability to change, to come alive and ponder its own actions, to get better, however long it takes, that constitutes the difference between authoritarian regimes and Western democracy. Let us not forget that the Russian people have been manipulated, and that we are not entirely safe from such totalitarian strategies, much like we saw in the election of President Donald Trump. The difference here is that President Trump was unable to manipulate the process, even with the use of riots, lawsuits, and rhetoric, to force his way into power even longer. But Putin was. The message here is that totalitarian regimes rise from democratic nations. And when we blindly subscribe to a person and buy into the boogeyman they claim to be protecting us from, we enslave ourselves to their cause. They force us to hate people we have never met, fight in wars we do not understand. They essentially strip us of our freedom and humanity. In a world of confusing events, trust yourself, reserve judgment, and never hate people just because you do not know or understand them.